rock. Party people, can yo get funky? Suicide and folks, can yo get funky? The Zulu Nation, can yo get funky? Yeah, just hit me. Released in 1982, Planet Rock became the fastest selling 12 inch single ever and established a new platform for hip hop. It was released by a tiny new independent label called Tommy Boy Records, which was the creation of a music journalist called Tom Silverman. I went to hear um, Ben by the DJ, and afterwards I talked to him. I said, So, like, you're putting all these records together, why don't we make a record? Because I had started a label. Uh, in case you know, I found something really interesting. Let's let's put a demo together. Let's make a record that uses like some of these records here. You know, you're cutting up. And I was telling Tom, you know, I said, you know, with all this electronic music I was playing, I said, there's there's no black electronic group. I said, I want this sound as something like Kraftwerk, because I was deep into Kraftwerk, Ella Mac, Jet Orchestra, Gary Newman. the studio called Intergalactic and they, they kind of didn't know the lines that well. They had sort of had them written down and they, but they weren't memorized that well and Pow Wow had one section and he couldn't remember his words. So he went and we said let's keep that, you know, let's, that sounds good and it's on the record and it's one of the parts everybody sings along with. <laughs> True to hip hop's DJ tradition of taking breakbeats from existing records, Planet Rock blended melodies from half a dozen songs. One of them was Trans Europe Express by the German band Kraftwerk. We got sued by Kraftwerk's publishing company. And we paid an ungodly amount of uh, a royalty per, uh, per so, uh, record that we sold. But even being sued by Kraftwerk, couldn't diminish Planet Rock's stature as the first hip-hop record to win both crossover pop success and grassroots credibility. Planet Rock was just some whole new shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Planet Rock opened up a whole nother world of music. It exposed another audience to hip-hop and, and it started merging those two audiences. It was one of the first records that really crossed over the barriers um, into the pop field and, and, and really brought hip-hop worldwide. Hip-hop's newfound success in the record industry only intensified the competitiveness of the old days. While Bambata was reveling in his breakthrough at Tommy Boy, his old rivals Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five were about to release a record on the Sugar Hill label that would raise hip-hop's rising stature a notch higher. Planet Rock was like the hottest fucking record at that time. I mean, you, you, you heard it everywhere and I was like, if somebody could just get a record that could knock off Planet Rock. And when the message came out, I knew we were going to knock Planet Rock off. And we're going to tell y'all about New York City. We love it over there. This is what it's like. We're going to tell y'all about this. We got broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the fish. You know they just don't care. I can't take the smell. Can't take the noise. Got no money to move out. I guess I got no choice. Released in July 1982, the message was the rawest form of rap yet put on record. A song with adult themes that demanded to be taken seriously. The message was kind of a puzzle to everybody when it first came out. It's like they're putting out this slow song in a time where, you know what I'm saying, everything is kind of upbeat, up tempo, whatever. But the content of the message is what caught everybody. Anybody could have said, you know, even don't push me because I'm close to the edge, I'm trying not to lose my head. At that time, anybody could have said that. You know, at that time, you know, half the people in America probably wanted to say that. And then when the record came out, it was like somebody said this shit. Here it is. Unlike most of its predecessors, the message used specially composed music. 
It was written by Ed Fletcher, a former school teacher turned record producer at Sugar Hill, who went by the nickname of Duke Booty. He wrote the song at the piano in the basement of his mother's house in suburban New Jersey. Came down here, actually here. You know, which is like piano, which is a piano. I got the ba ba da ba 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 on, and I just kept playing it and came up with verses for that. It's like a jungle sometimes, you know, broken glass everywhere. I mean, if you look around the neighborhood, you kind of see things were going on. I created this track. Fletcher did the track, it was his idea. He did the track from top to bottom. He did the music, we helped with the music. I came up with the ba ba da ba da ba 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 a little melody line on the message, even though they don't credit me for it, but that was my, I came up with, you know, we all added a little bit of this and this and that and that, even though Fletcher was the main theme writer, he brought it all in there. I think if you have a good idea, you could damn near beat on some cardboard and snap some rubber bands and people will respond to it. You know, and if it's funky enough, you make Lassie dance with it. But the message almost never happened. When Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five were first offered the song, they didn't want to record it. Everybody was doing party music. So it was like, nah, this is not, you know, this is a little bit too serious. You know, we don't know if our fans are get into something like this. And nobody wanted to do it. In the end, Melly Mel was the only member of the Furious Five who took part in recording the song. I wrote the part of Child is Born with No State of Mind, the very last... <clears throat> very last rhyme that was on the message. A child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. God is smiling on you, but he's frowning too, cause only God knows what you'll go through. You'll grow in the ghetto, live a second rate. Your eyes will sing a song of deep hate. The places you play and where you stay looks like one great big alleyway. You'll admire The owners of the Sugar Hill label decided to release the message under the name Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five because they felt the group's image was right for the song. But it was only after the message was a hit that the group really accepted the song. And even then, Grandmaster Flash himself was less than happy. It was the first record for Flash and where the whole Flash wasn't going to be on the record. Flash isn't even on the record. From a public's point of view, it was like the incredible record. But from what I believe in, it's extremely important that I do things that allow me to show people who I am, not as a group figure, but as an individual. And that's the biggest problem I had with that record. At one time, his name was known all over the world just from being on a record that he didn't even do nothing off. He, he should be happy. I wish I could have been on every record and didn't do nothing in there with just Melly Mel on the record. And everyone, oh, yeah, there was Melly Mel. I mean, what did you do? I didn't do a fucking thing. I mean, I'm famous. Hey, you know what I mean? Could you write me a check? You know what I mean? Shit. <laughs> you know? Ironically, the message was the last song recorded by the group. They split up six months later. But the impact of the message, combined with the earlier success of Planet Rock, had awoken the music industry to the commercial potential of hip-hop.